whenever you bring up any of these arguments, people will say, oh, you're just a culture warrior. Right? Okay, I am just a culture warrior because I actually happen to think our culture is the reason we are where we are. I'm Tom Switzer and I'm the Executive Director at the Centre for Independent Studies. And for those of you who don't know much about CIS, if this is your first CIS event, we're a public policy research organisation. We're just based down the road on Macquarie Street, 131 Macquarie Street. We usually do our events there, but on special occasions like this, we needed to find the extra room. Now, we are dedicated to tackling our nation's greatest challenges by producing work that promotes our core classical liberal beliefs. So we promote economic opportunity for all, healthy institutions of civil society, education reforms that improve teaching standards and schools outcomes. And, and this is especially important for an event like tonight, we are passionate defenders of our Western liberal cultural heritage. And that also means we are strong critics of those cancellers and they're broadly speaking to be found on the left spectrum of politics. We are strong critics of the cancellers who wish to strangle debate, kill the ethos of a liberal society, suppress ideas and seek to standardise opinion. And indeed on many issues from the energy transition to identity politics, to censoring children's books, the prevailing Western narrative, the prevailing wisdom across much of the elite media and the political class can be stifling and intolerant. Well, we at CIS are among those groups who stand up to that illiberalism. And that, <clears throat> and that brings us to tonight's speaker, Konstantin Kissin. Now, Konstantin is a popular Russian-born British podcaster, pundit and satirist who distinguished himself a year ago, you may have seen this at the Oxford Union debate, a year ago pretty much to the day, where Constantine took issue with the notion of a woke culture and the debate was whether it had gone too far. And he argued that all wokeness has to offer is, quote, to brainwash bright young minds like you to believe that you are victims. And the result, and remember we're talking about Oxford University here, the result, his side carried the debate by a margin of 89 to 60. And get this, his widely praised lecture, which you can easily find on YouTube, has attracted close to 3 million views on YouTube, but also 100 million views across online platforms, 100 million views. Extraordinary. <laughs> now, Constantine has been a guest at CIS for the last week. We've done sold out events in Perth, Melbourne with our friends at the Institute for Public Affairs, and of course, here tonight. He's co-host, as many of you probably know, of Trigonometry, and he's author of An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, which is a Sunday Times bestseller. Now, after Constantine's opening remarks, my colleague Glenn Fay, who heads our education program, he'll exchange thoughts, including some of the questions that you have sent us. But for now, it's a great pleasure to welcome, and please join me in welcoming, Constantine Kissin. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get any further, please join me in thanking Tom, Deanne, Glenn, and uh, the rest of this team at the CS for having me here for uh, the last week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my uh, first time here in Australia. I didn't really know what to expect uh, when I first came over. And a guy on the plane recognized me and started talking to me and found out I was coming to give a few talks. And he said, mate, watch out. Australia is uh, getting very politically correct. There's a big problem uh, with political correct. And I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, so I get off the plane. I get to my hotel. The lady checks me and gives me the card. And she goes, and if you want breakfast tomorrow, head to the two fat Indians. <laughs> I thought, this is my kind of place. Because <laughs> in the UK, we wouldn't say that. We don't say fat, we say people of girth. <laughs> 
Actually, on the way here, Tom asked me what my what I think of Australia. What's my take on Australia? And here it is. I think it's a country that looks like America, full of British people who aren't miserable. <laughs> That's basically what I'm getting here. <laughs> Uh, now, it's such a pleasure to see so many young people here. Several of you are under 60. <laughs> Thank you for coming, all six of you. <laughs> no, it's, it's really great to be here. I'm not going to speak for very long. I just thought I would touch very briefly on a subject that Tom's already raised, which is, of course, the West. Now, I'm not an academic. I always say I claim zero expertise, but as long as keep, people keep asking my opinion, I'll keep giving it. Uh, and the reason I think about the West quite a lot at the moment is the reason that I think we all think about the West, which is the direction of travel. I have to say in, in the week or, or in a bit that I've been here, I don't think you guys are quite as far down the slippery slope that other Western countries are. I usually get booed when I say this um, uh, here in Australia, but I do think it's true. I think you are in a better way. Um, but the reason I care about it, actually, there's several people here who, who were like me born in the Soviet Union is I've seen the other side, uh, albeit briefly, uh, and I'm aware that what we have in the West is unusual. Now, uh, by the way, those of you who've seen my ARC speech, of course, I mentioned I was from the Soviet Union and I brought up Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, and I was immediately accused online, as is common in this situation, of something quite ridiculous. So I was accused of comparing myself with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. There is no comparison. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn spent 20 years or however long it was in the Soviet gulag, where he endured brutal punishments of starvation, diet, and all sorts of other nastiness. I went to a British boarding school. <laughs> That's where the similarities end. <laughs> but what is the West? And it strikes me that I'm in the right place to ask this question. Because if I had to conduct an experiment to prove that our societies and our culture and our civilization are unique, it would be what the British did here. I would round up a few thousand of my least law-abiding citizens, and I would ship them over to the other side of the world to a barren land full of venomous creatures, and I'd leave them there for a couple of hundred years. And I'd come back and I would see what was happening. And if I found 200 years later that this society was thriving, that would require some sort of explanation. What do I mean by thriving, by the way? Well, we could talk about GDP per capita or all sorts of other things, but actually you only need to look at what's happening. How many young Australians are getting on small rickety boats every year and braving shark infested waters in search of a better life? And how many people until your government did something about it, we're trying to do the opposite and come here. Millions of people are crossing the southern border of the United States illegally every year and risking their lives dealing with Mexican drug cartels and all sorts of terrible things that happen to them on the way to get into the United States. Tens of thousands of people risk their lives by getting on small boats to cross the English Channel every year to get into the UK illegally. Likewise with the Mediterranean. Now, why is that? Why are people coming? Why do people want to come to our societies as I once did? Well, the answer is very politically incorrect, I'm afraid. And by the way, um, political correctness is a phrase I like to pick up on because most people in the West do not know where the term comes from. Political correctness never had anything to do with not offending minorities and perfect, pr protecting the rights of people and anything like that. Political correctness was invented in the Soviet Union for one reason and one reason only, so that they could say, comrade, what you're saying is factually correct, but it's politically incorrect. And what that meant was what you're saying is true, but it is not compliant with the party line of the day. And that is increasingly how restriction of speech is being used in the West, which is what we'll come to in a second. But the politically correct truth is that the reason people want to come to our societies is that they're better. Sorry, they are. And I don't mean that we, are, we have a higher moral value or we are somehow morally superior. I just mean that people come to our societies because they're better at creating the sorts of things that human beings seem to want. Safety, prosperity, 
the ability to change your gender every morning, you know, things like that. <laughs> now, why are our societies better at creating these things? Why? Why are societies better at doing this? Freedom. Very good, sir. You've watched too many Hollywood movies. <laughs> Any other ideas? Someone say democracy. Good. Democracy. Good. Why are societies better at creating safety and prosperity? Probably good. Now, there are some answers. Because if you, if you say freedom and democracy, you have to explain why those things are good. Why is freedom good? Why is democracy good? These are just words. And the things that we mean by them don't really correlate to the outcomes of safety and prosperity. We have to be able to explain what the link is between those things and the things that people actually crave. Because there are not many people who get on a boat in search of freedom and democracy. Most people are coming because the societies are safer and more prosperous. Now, why is that? Well, what do we mean by democracy exactly? I once asked Jordan Peterson this question at dinner. I said, what is Western civilization? And Jordan did what Jordan often does. He, he, he launched into a 20-minute monologue. <laughs> and eight, the first 18 minutes, I've had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. And then around the 19-minute mark, it all comes together and it starts to make sense. So as many of you are nodding because you're familiar with the experience. That's the beauty of Jordan. He's able to explain these complex concepts. And he said that within a chimp troop, there are, true, there are two, rather, there are two primary strategies for how the alpha male is able to rule the troop. The first is uh, you rule by strength and brute force. And as long as you are the strongest, the most powerful, the most violent male in the group, the biggest in the group, you're able to dominate others. However, it's quite a bad long-term strategy because the moment you lose your dominance, the moment you're not the strongest or the moment that two smaller chimps can get together and take you down, your life ends and pretty quickly and pretty brutally. The other strategy, and it's the reason that most many, many uh, alpha males in chimp troops are actually quite often one of the smaller males, is a coalition strategy. It's a strategy whereby the, the alpha male grooms the other members of the tribe in a good way. Uh, <laughs> And this reciprocal exchange, this coalition building approach is how the chimp, the alpha male chimp is able to maintain authority and control over that troop. And this is a much better long-term strategy. And this is what we mean by democracy. It's not always been democracy in the Western world, but what we mean is government by consent. The fact that our leaders are answerable to us in some way, in a way that they're not in almost every other society. Uh, give you an example. Uh, Tom and I had a big uh, row today on, on the on the CIS podcast about Ukraine. And whatever you think was the reason that Vladimir Putin felt the need to invade, uh, one of the things we do now know is that the reason he felt comfortable to do so is that nobody in his inner circle is really able to tell him the truth anymore. He thought that it would be easy. He thought that the Ukrainians would welcome his troops with bread and salt and so on. And this wasn't the case. Now, our model of government by consent means that our leaders are unable to put themselves in this bubble. Uh, and if they do, reality strikes them in the face very, very quickly. But it's not, I'm not just talking about politics. The idea of government by consent is the reason that our armies fight better, because the soldier on the ground is able to pass information up the chain of command in a way that he might not be in an army that is much more uh, hierarchical and authoritarian. There are many, many reasons why this model uh, works better. For example, uh, there is a reason that uh, Western countries have not had a Chernobyl-sized nuclear disaster, because the sorts of human errors that were made in that tragedy are much less likely to be made in a less hierarchical, less authoritarian system. Government by consent is one of the reasons that we have been able to be as successful as we are. Now, the second reason I want to talk to you about uh, that I think is the bedrock of our success is something that we're practicing right here, right now, and uh, Tom raised, which is, of course, freedom of expression. Now, again, we talk about freedom of expression as if it's some kind of moral good, right? It's, it's good. It's just good. Freedom of expression, yeah, it's good. Isn't it? Why? Why is it good? Why is the, peop the, the ability to speak freely good? We have to be able to answer this question. 
if we are to teach our children the values of our civilization, and if we're to explain to them why they should actually care about these things. Because just saying from the height of our authority, these things are good is not enough, as we can see, right? Now, why is freedom of expression good? Well, the first thing is that you cannot think freely if you cannot speak. You have to speak to be able to think. And when you speak, you often find out whether, you, whether what you're saying is complete crap. <laughs> because someone will tell you. And it, that's basically Twitter in a nutshell, right? <laughs> and it is this sharpening of idea against idea that has produced the technological and scientific progress that we've been able to make. Now, my experience is that when I go around the West and I speak to people like you about this, people in the West do not understand the extent of our technological and scientific superiority through not only today, but through the ages. I, I mean, you, you can go to almost any part of our Western history and, and see this. Uh, the example I like to give most recently is because of the Oppenheimer movie, which I'm sure many of you have seen. How many of you have seen it? Just, okay, half of you. So I'll explain for the rest of you. It's a movie about the Manhattan Project, the developing of the nuclear bomb in the 40s in the United States. Now, because it's a Hollywood movie, uh, they spend the entire time, you know, focusing on the Red Scare and McCarthyism and how dare, the, you know, the Americans oppress these poor little communists. But at the end, they slip in the fact that the only reason the Soviet Union got the nuclear bomb was because of communists working on the Manhattan Project who gave it to Stalin. Communists in America gave the nuclear bomb to Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union, the second greatest superpower in the world couldn't develop one by themselves. And it's interesting because the nuclear bomb that the Soviet Union developed shortly afterwards was called RDS-1, which stands for Russia Dilet Sama. Russia does it by itself. <laughs> Quite ironic given that it was lifted almost entirely from the Americans. Go back to history. I mean, we talk often about colonialism, right? Hernan Cortez arrives in Central America and he takes down an empire of six million Aztecs with a few hundred conquistadors and some local allies. That is the level of technological superiority that we enjoy, and that is the reason why Western nations dominate the world. And there have been times when that hasn't been true. We often talk about the fall of Constantinople as this great moment in history where the, the, the former Roman Empire ended conclusively. Well, there are many reasons, cultural and historical, that it happened, but actually the reason that the walls of Constantinople could be breached is that Mehmed II had bigger cannons. It's as simple as that. And the story repeats time and time and time again. Now, how do you get from freedom to progress? Well, one of the reasons is, of course, that we have been much freer comparatively from the dogma of religion, from the dogma of authoritarian government, from the dogma of, the dogma of social uh, and societal uh, orthodoxy is probably the right word, to be able to do things that other people in other societies have not, because we've had the freedom to do so. Now, let's be clear, I'm not by any means suggesting that we have some kind of monopoly on innovation. Uh, you know, you know gunpowder is invented in China, but almost every major, and Victor Davis Hansen has a wonderful lecture on YouTube about this, which I recommend people watch, when he talks about the Western way of war, and he makes many of the points that I'm making tonight, um, gunpowder invented in, in China and almost every development in the history of firearms from the musket to the automatic rifle to the cruise missile is then made in the West. But freedom of expression and freedom of research and freedom of science is not enough. The thing that really makes this work is we have a unique incentive structure in the West. Uh, Charlie Munger uh, and I think it was Charlie Munger, the, the great investor, I think who passed away recently, he said, that, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. We have created an incentive structure that is unique around the world. And people, again, in the West, forgive me, do not understand what the hell I'm talking about. Somebody, when I asked why we're successful, mentioned uh, the rule of law and private property. Now, you don't understand this, most of you, but private property does not exist in the rest of the world. The richest man in Russia was Mikhail Khodorkovsky. He was the richest man in Russia for as long as he didn't give, give money to opposition parties in Russia. The moment he did, he ceased being the richest man in Russia. And he went to prison for 10 years. 
Jack Ma, the sixth richest man in China, uh, makes some, some comments about banking regulation, of all things, disappears and uh, is thoroughly re-educated. Uh, Bao Fan uh, disappears a year ago, one of the richest men in China again, reappears a few weeks ago, uh, changed man again, uh, miraculously gives up all his position in his own company. Right? You do not have private property in most of the rest of the world. Now, why does it matter? Well, one of the reasons it matters is if everything you create can be taken away from you by an authoritarian tyrant, the incentive is not to innovate. The incentive is to comply. And our, the fact that the way you succeed in our societies is by creating things and providing things of value to other people is the way you get ahead. And that's why we are innovators like we are. In the Soviet Union, where I grew up, it was not innovation or creativity that got you ahead. It was compliance with the party dogma, uh, serving the, the elite that existed at the time, a very small one. And this is, of course, the same in corrupt regimes around the world. In a corrupt country where there's a strong authoritarian caste, you're not going to advance by being creative and free. You're going to advance by doing whatever the hell you need to do to get on the right side of those people and facilitate the corruption that's happening in your society. So freedom of expression, capitalism, a dirty word now, and government by consent are three of the major reasons we are where we are. But we no longer have the language or the ability to articulate these things, which is why I wrote in my book that I think the West has become a cargo cult. Now, I know that many of you in this room will know what I mean in this neck of the woods, but some of you will not, so let me remind you. During World War II, the Americans and the Japanese used many islands, small islands in the Pacific, to station troops, use them as airstrips, supply dumps, etc., ammo dumps, etc., and when they were using these small islands, there were some local tribes, fairly primitive tribes technologically, that lived there too, which benefited, who benefited massively from the Japanese and the Americans giving them food, clothing, medicine, etc., to, to get their compliance. And they watched this for years. The, the planes would land, drop off supplies, take off, and then they watched all this process, and they benefited massively from the clothes, the medicine, the food, etc. And then the war ended. And the Americans and Japanese left. And they took their clothes and their supplies and their medicines. And the tribes that lived there were lost. What do you do? Well, what they did is they started to imitate what they'd seen. They would make headphones out of coconuts. They would march up and down fake airstrips like they'd seen the American soldiers do. They would build towers, radio towers, out of bamboo and sit in them expecting the planes to come back. And this is what we increasingly do. We imitate the things that made us successful instead of practicing them. That is why the West, in my opinion, is in great peril, or at least has the potential to end up in great peril, because we no longer are able to articulate these values to ourselves, and we're not longer able to articulate them to our children. We now have two or three generations of people who have not been taught any of the things that we've just discussed. Instead, they've been taught about the evils of our society and our history is terrible. And I always say to these people, what, who are you comparing us to? What, you think the Ottomans were woke? <laughs> is that what, look at Russia, the biggest country on the map. How do you think it became as big as it did? Right. So we have allowed ourselves to, to be lied to about our history. And that is one of the reasons that we are where we are. Now, whenever you bring up any of these arguments, People will say, oh, you're just a culture warrior. Right. Okay, I am just a culture warrior because I actually happen to think our culture is the reason we are where we are. And I think our culture is worth prote protecting, our culture is worth defending, and our culture is worth remembering. Our culture is worth understanding how we got here. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. To see the Q&A from this talk, click the video link here. And don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to get more content just like this.